So the title of my talk is In Silico Synthesis of uh, New ITC Conventional Superconductors. So this doesn't mean, like Walter was saying, I'm not synthesizing anything. I, in silico means I uh, on a computer. So what I'm going to tell you is how you can, in principle, synthesize materials on a computer. And I'm not speaking about fancy uh, materials, fancy physics like we heard so far, but we're talking about conventional, so boring uh, electron phonon superconductors. The good thing of having to do with uh, boring superconductors is that we know how to, to treat them, and then we can actually uh, address uh, the problem of uh, really designing materials. So what I want to explain you today is actually how you can uh, design or how you can uh, dream uh, of new materials. So in general, if this works, the, the question that we want to ask and that we that have been working on in the last five years or a bit more is uh, if you can design useful superconductors. Useful means that if you want to use superconductors for uh, large scale applications, you want materials which have some properties or so you want materials which have, first of all, a, a high TC, so you don't want to pull with uh, helium. Then you want materials which are easy to manufacture. So you, you don't want uh, materials which are too brittle and they have to be affordable. So in principle, you, you want to control also what kind of elements uh, you use so that uh, they're not going to be uh, super expensive. And I'm not going to answer all these questions. So the answer to all these questions is not yes, it's almost. And I think that uh, the reason why the answer is almost is that in the last 10 years, maybe 15 years, there has been a very, very large progress in ab initio methods. So in methods, uh, in DFT uh, based methods to deal uh, with superconductors. And uh, at the moment, I mean, to, to address this question, we are addressing several routes. So we are looking in detail at uh, boron carbon systems. We are go uh, looking at so-called uh, superhydrides. So uh, uh, superconducting hydrides which form under pressure. And we are looking also at uh, high throughput screening means I'm, I'm looking at like more intelligent methods to, to screen materials. But what I uh, would like to tell you a bit more about today is our recent work on this uh, ternary superhydrates. And this is a, a short outline of my talk. So before I actually introduce our work, I just want to explain a little bit the basics of how you can predict superconductors and I will tell you a little bit the story of these uh, superhydrates and why we are actually looking at superhydrates. And then we, uh, I'll show you this uh, work on ternary superhydrates where we try to address the question of how to uh, reduce the stabilization pressure. So how to uh, have materials which have a high TC like superconducting hydrates, but work closer to ambient pressure. And the last question is uh, actually, if the methods that we use to estimate the synthesis ability of compound are good enough or if they can be improved. So let's start from the beginning methods. How do we predict superconductors in silico? So in silico means uh, on a computer. So if you want to uh, predict superconductor, it really means that we imagine we have uh, a set of elements. So we have a few elements, we mix them together. We can control the the external condition and we want to uh, predict what kind of material will form. And in general, this uh, problem can be split in two parts. So the, the first part, let's imagine that we can control exactly the composition of the, of the things that we put in. So we want to do what is called a, to predict uh, what will form at fixed composition. So we, we, we have a composition and we want to predict which crystal structure will uh, be stable at that composition. And in principle to do this, what you have to do is to compute what is called the, the potential energy surface of your material. So you, you have uh, a system, for example, here carbon, you imagine that carbon can uh, crystallize in all possible crystal structures. And then you want to find the minimum of this surface, which will correspond to the uh, stable crystal structure at that particular pressure, for example. So if you, uh, I mean, if you had an infinite amount of time, that would be very easy. You could just, uh, and a super 
powerful computer, you could just put your atoms in all possible crystal structures and then compare the, the relative energies or the relative enthalpies and find the minimum of your surface. This is in general not doable. So what is done is actually to use a bit smarter methods to explore this uh, potential energy surface. And you don't want to explore it all, but you just want to uh, locate the main minima and in particular the global minimum, which indicates uh, the crystal structure, which is stable at that pressure. And this is now something that you can do even on a, on a normal PC if you have a, a binary system and a unit cell, which is not too large, this is something you can do. Uh, the second question, I mean, now you have found, for example, that if you mix uh, hydrogen and oxygen, you will form water and water will have a certain crystal structure. But the question is, if you cannot really uh, control your system, so you, you're just mixing the elements and you want to know actually which particular compound would form, so which compositions will be stable. If you're mixing, for example, hydrogen and uh, oxygen at ambient pressure, you know that you form water, but you can also form uh, hydrogen peroxide. And this is called the, the convex hull construction. So you, you basically, what you have to do is to perform a lot of these searches for different compositions and then compare the relative formation enthalpy. You construct the most convex curve, which, con uh, which connects this point. In this case, it, it's this triangle here. And all the points which are on this curve are stable composition, all the other points are metastable, which means that, for example, if you take hydrogen perovskite and you leave it long enough, it will decompose into the, the stable composition. Uh, so in principle, I mean, this, uh, this is a, a binary system. You can generalize this to, to a, an, I mean, a, a larger number of elements. And then you, you can imagine that you can really, uh, in this idea, you can uh, model the synthesis. So you can model the fact that you uh, combine a certain number of elements. So once you have done this, you, you have an idea, you have mapped, let's say your, the phase diagram of your system, you know which this structure will form. We are looking for superconductors. So you need uh, a way to estimate whether the compound that will form is a superconductor or not. And for this, uh, I mean, now uh, that there has been also here an amazing development in, in the methods. And here, what I'm showing is uh, how accurate current methods for uh, conventional superconductors are. This is a benchmark from, from the group of Hardy Gross. And here he is comparing several uh, standard superconductors. So here, uh, I think black is experiment and green are the uh, critical temperatures which are predicted from DFT, in particular from superconducting DFT in this case. I want to remark that uh, here there is not the, the mu star problem. So there is no mu star. This is a fully uh, ab initio prediction. And you see that basically you have an error, which may be 5%. You can also have an idea of the progress. So this, these red bars correspond to what you would have gotten more or less with the methods in, in 2005. So you see that the accuracy has really increased. So in principle, we have a method to predict uh, uh, chemical stability. We have a method to do, predict the physical properties. And now we have, we need a little bit still of physical intuition to understand what kind of systems would actually uh, exhibit. In particular, we are uh, focusing on uh, high temperature superconductivity. And this, uh, this was the idea of looking at hydrides. This is a very, very old idea. Actually, it dates back to 68, 69, Ashcroft and Ginsburg. Metallic hydrogen, you all probably know, uh, basically the, the standard formula is the uh, macmillan lannel lines formula for TC. You see that basically if you want to uh, increase the critical temperature, it's good to uh, look at by elements so that you have large typical phonon frequencies. It's good also to look at elements. You have this lambda in the exponential. So it's good to look at elements which have uh, a large electron phonon matrix element. And actually the idea of Ashcroft and uh, Ginsburg was that if one could actually obtain metallic hydrogen, metallic hydrogen would be a fantastic conventional superconductor because of course the mass would be low, but also this uh, I, this electron ion potential would be extremely large because I, um, hydrogen doesn't have any core electrons. So the, the interaction between nuclei and electrons is totally uh, unscreened. 
uh, problem with this prediction was that it was made in the in 69 and at that time basically metallic hydrogen didn't exist uh, there are the few a few papers which appeared in 2019 2020 about the metallization of hydrogen so it has been observed but you need something like uh, 500 gpa to get there so the the thing which really uh, gave a big boost to the to the field was another idea of uh, again of Ashcroft, another prediction from 2004, and the idea is that if you want to uh, have, I mean, to have this kind of hydrogen superconductivity, maybe you don't really need hydrogen. Maybe it's enough to take uh, something a hydrogen-rich uh, system. So it's enough to take a hydride and squeeze it. I mean, you, you need uh, hydrides at any pressure usually are not metallic, so you need to put them uh, under pressure. And if you put them under pressure, uh, hydrogen will, uh, I mean, the, the hydrogen in the hydride will believe, uh, will behave more or less like metallic hydrogen. And then the, the other atoms which are in the, in the structure will, uh, will help you because they, they will exert what is called the chemical pressure. So this is one of the, uh, and this idea was, uh, proposed in 2014, and it was actually realized for the first time in 2014, uh, this was proposed in 2004, and realized 10 years later in this SH3, which was discovered by Michael Eremetz here in, uh, in Germany. And there have been uh, a few other compounds discovered soon after, so this is one of these compounds. And here you see, this is really a, a perfect realization of the idea of, of Ashcroft, this is lanthanum H10, so you have these huge green balls, which are uh, lantern atoms, and they are surrounded by cages of uh, hydrogen. And uh, basically, I mean, with this uh, arrangement, you have a stabilization pressure, which is 150 G GPA. So this is uh, still very high, but much lower than the, the metallization threshold of hydrogen. And especially this was a pressure that could be uh, reached in 2014. And this discovery actually uh, gave rise to what is called a, a, a hydrate rush. So there have been uh, there has been a lot of work going on in this field, uh, a lot of work driven also by theoretical predictions. There have been a lot of predictions which have been uh, later confirmed of what uh, hydrates can be stabilized and which ones should be ITC and so on. So I would say that now uh, the phase space of binary hydrates has been completely uh, explored so you can uh, i mean there are published table of binary hydrates which show you uh, predictions and in some cases measurements of uh, superconductivity there are around a dozen i would say of binary hydrates which have tcs over 100 kelvin so which are high tc uh, and here are the records so the highest tc is the compound that i showed you before which is lanthanum h10 to 160 kelvin there is a prediction by us actually of 310 Kelvin in yttrium H10, which has not been synthesized. And the lowest pressure, the lowest stabilization pressure, which has been measured is 100 GPA. So this is probably the best you can do with binary hydrates. So somehow you have a very exciting discovery, but you, you also know that, I mean, this is not going to solve the problem that I was uh, proposing before. So you, you're not, uh, so we are not finding anything which can be used. The question is, can we still ex uh, exploit these ideas to, uh, to get closer to uh, applications, so to get closer to something useful? And the answer is yes. And if you don't want to depart too much from the idea of hydrides, the, the simplest thing that you can do is to move from binary to ternary hydrides. This seems uh, like a small step, but actually the complexity of your problem grows a lot. First of all, because if you count simply how many compounds you can have, you can have around 7,000 combinations of uh, hydrates against uh, around 100 binaries. What becomes very complicated is also this convex cell construction that I was showing before. I mean, the, you must imagine that you, you should sample now uh, the space of ternary composition, which is much more uh, complicated than the space of binary compositions. And so there have been a, a few works on uh, theory and experiment on binary hydrates. There are not so many works. Uh, 
the, most works actually at the beginning they address the problem of reaching uh, room temperature superconductivity or higher. So this was a prediction from 2009. There is a, a nature paper from 2020 which claims basically ambient uh, temperature superconductivity. The pressure is still very high. And there is even a, a paper from uh, the Argonne group, which actually claims to have observed something like 440 Gertz, so <laughs> very, very hot uh, superconductivity. Uh, what we actually want to see is whether we can, uh, instead of raising the, the critical temperature, we want to get to lower pressure. And so let's see, to our uh, room pressure, ITC conventional superconductivity, this is a work uh, that we did uh, a couple of years ago. This is wrong, this should be 2022. So uh, the, the idea that we had in the beginning was simply to see whether we could confirm there were reports. It was 2020, so it was during the lockdown. There was this uh, report of hot superconductivity, very exciting, and uh, but there was just a spec. I mean, they, they just show some resistivity curve, but they they didn't do any X-ray, so there, there was nothing understood about what kind of Thing could be in the in the diamond and the middle cell. They just said they just described the experiments so that they said which elements could be present in the in the diamond and middle cell. They did. But uh, we didn't know uh, the composition. We didn't know anything. So one of my students, he was he's very good actually, and he asked me if we could try. I mean, and, and what he did, he, he was really looking at everything which was in the cell and doing predictions and try to see if there was anything popping up that could explain uh, this remarkable TC. The answer was no. So we didn't find any uh, structure which had a TC of 440 Kelvin. We found a lot of structure which had 150, 200 Kelvin, but we found something which we thought it was much more interesting. So we found the compound, uh, if you lower the pressure, we found the compound which had a TC, which is, was over 100 Kelvin, but instead of breaking down at 150 GPA, like most binary, super, uh, binary hydrides would stay, would survive up to 35 GPA. Okay, this is not uh, ambient pressure, it's much closer than, than what was known at the moment. And if we, then we, we zoomed in and we look at this compound, and actually there is a very nice explanation of why this particular compound could be stabilized to uh, such low pressure. So this is the same compound that I was showing before to explain what chemical pressure is. This is lanthanum H10. Uh, we said you have this lanthanum which pushes on the hydrogen sublattice and stabilizes it. And this thing works until uh, 150 GPA, then if you compute the phonon spectrum, you see that your compound breaks down. So you see that your compound starts to uh, de develop a dynamical instability. And this means that uh, this uh, very nice structure, which is ITC, breaks down. This is a binary. So how do you turn such a binary into a ternary, which can survive to lower pressure? This is the solution. So you see that there are these small squares in the original structure. And now the, the compound which popped up is this lanthanum BH8. So this looks very much like this. So you have this kind of cages, hydrogen cages that you need to, to, to have metallic hydrogen superconductivity. You have your big lanthanum, but then in the interstitial of this structure, you plug in a small atom. So you plug in this small boron atom. And this small boron atom actually gives a little bit extra it pushes a bit more. So it gives a little bit extra pressure. And with this extra pressure, you actually still get the dynamical instability, but you get a dynamical instability at 35 GPA. So you have a reduction of a factor five of the pressure that you, uh, that you need to stabilize the, this kind of metals. Okay. So basically what we did, we did a bit more. So we, you are on a computer, so it's easy actually to, to do chemistry, to, to explore the space. Here, this is uh, another paper where we looked actually, so we, we sat at 50 GPA and we started looking what happens if you replace the small atoms or the big atoms with some other atoms. Uh, long story short, we found that uh, there are two silicides, which are baryon silicon H8, 
and strontium silicon H8, which are also stable at 50 GPA. You can do a bit more. And uh, what you find here is that uh, the dynamical instability pressure for these two compounds is lower than in lanthanum boron H8. It's around 25 GPA for strontium, which has a very high TC. And it's around actually three GPA, so very close to ambient pressure for this barium compound. Here you see the solution basically of this uh, Eliasberg equation. So here we plot the gap and you see that the gap closes at 77 Kelvin. So we have in principle predicted uh, 77 Kelvin ternary hydride, which is stable not at ambient pressure, but very, very close to ambient pressure. So three GPA, we jump from, one on, from basically 150 to three. Okay, and I think three GPA is more or less the resolution that you have in your prediction. So this is almost an under pressure superconductor. We were very happy. So the last two minutes, I wanted to show you something more. We were very happy, but we were a bit cheating in the sense that we are using, like everybody's doing, to, to estimate whether a compound is stable or unstable at a given pressure. We compute what is called the dynamical stability. So we just compute the phonon spectrum and we see whether the compound is stable. This in principle just tells us that uh, our system is metastable, but it doesn't tell us how long it will survive. So we know we are somewhere on this uh, potential energy surface uh, that we are in a local minimum, but in principle, I mean, the, the, the average, we don't know the average lifetime of our minimum. So what we have tried also to do in this uh, work is to come up with a better way to estimate the lifetime of a metastable structure using something which is called a variable cell nudge elastic band method. So what we have done is to uh, explore basically the transition path that brings us from our metastable structure to the more stable structure at that given pressure. And here you see, so the, there is a barrier. So the, this is your minimum, your minimum is protected by a barrier and this barrier gives you more or less the, uh, the lifetime of your uh, metastable structure. And here you see that unfortunately, if I do this game, if I play this game for barium silicon, uh, the actual stability pressure, we call this the, the kinetic stability. So the actual kinetic stability pressure is 25. So it's higher than the dynamical stability pressure. But I think this is also a nice result because we are really going into the direction of trying to predict uh, stability of the structure. And with this, I think I'm done. This is just a, a short summary of what I said. And I use just the, the last minute to, to thank all the people in my group here uh, in Rome and in Graz who contributed to this uh, work. Thank you very much.